Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 141 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris and this is Chris. Hello. And there are some tweeting birds behind us. <laughs> Today we read All Our Wrong Todays by Ilan Mastai. Our patron Luchek asked us to read this for him as our tribute to his patronage for 2022. He said, I'm kind of requesting this one for my sanity. I read the reviews, went in hopeful, and then, well... I'm now wondering if I read the same book. If I'm not remembering it, or I'm psychotic, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I guess some minor context about the author. Uh, Ilan Mastai is a screenwriter, best known for his work on This Is Us and The F Word. Um, I have not... I've never seen either. Nope, I've never seen either. I know that they are popular, that is all I know. Um, so this is a man who typically writes screenplays, and he has decided to write a novel. All right, um, if this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Um, And sometimes, like today, we read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. So we typically do the opposite of what most people do when they're in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet and looking for something to read. Uh, Typically, this experiment results in a disappointing and hilarious read, but once in a while, we end up liking the book. Um, Content warnings today, so in addition to our usual barnyard language, today's episode includes discussion of both infidelity and suicide. Also that old classic, sexual assault. So uh, be mindful of yourselves. If those things don't work for you, uh, choose another episode. Okay, so here is the summary that appears on the Amazon page for All Our Wrong Todays. It's 2016, and in Tom Barron's world, technology has solved all of humanity's problems. There's no war, no poverty, no underripe avocados. <laughs> Unfortunately, Tom isn't happy. He's lost the girl of his dreams. And what do you do when you're heartbroken and have a time machine? Something stupid. Finding himself stranded in a terrible alternate reality, which we immediately recognize as our 2016, Tom is desperate to fix his mistake and go home. Right up until the moment he discovers wonderfully unexpected versions of his family, his career, and the woman who may just be the love of his life. Now Tom faces an impossible choice. Go back to his perfect but loveless life, or stay in our messy reality with a soulmate by his side. His search for the answer takes him across continents and timelines in a quest to figure out, finally, who he really is and what his future, our future, is supposed to be. Filled with humor and heart and packed with insight, intelligence, and mind-bending invention, All Our Wrong Todays is a powerful and moving story of life, loss, and love. All right. Thank you, Chris. And uh, would you like to do the characters and setting so that I can read the summary? Unless you were going to read the summary. I actually don't remember what our deal was. No. Um, I mean, the, the summary for this one's going to be an interesting mishmash of ideas. So, yeah, I'll just talk about... Our settings, multiple, and the characters that we encounter. Okay. All right. So there's two different versions of reality that we are in most of the time. There's a third that's alluded to at one point as well. But we have our current one circa 2016. So our reality as we experience it now. That's reality B in this book. Reality A is Tom's world, which is a technological utopia um, of, as the summary mentioned, no war, no underripe avocados, all your clothes fit all the time, 
there's no such thing as humidity. I don't know. All that fun <laughs> yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's all great. Um, and then there's a third apocalyptic reality that we'll call reality C for that purpose. Um, our main character is Tom Baron slash John slash Victor Baron, which we'll get into later. We can just shorten that all. Yeah, there's, John you know what, there's a, there's a John, John A, J- uh, shit, no, there's a Tom A, John B, Victor C, which we, yes. which we actually just call John Tor. That is yes. so, so. There is Penelope Weschler, who exists in... Reality A and B, perhaps not C. I'm not sure. Doesn't really matter that much. Um, you have Lionel Gutrider, who is an inventor and perhaps the greatest scientific mind of all time, as he basically invents unlimited clean energy. Um, you have Ursula, a fellow researcher, on his, when he was doing this research for this unlimited energy machine, who he has an affair with. Um, you have Jerome, who is Ursula's husband. In both realities? Yes, in both realities. Yeah, in A and B, correct. Yes. Um, and then you have Jom Tor's family in reality A, a utopia, which is just his parents. B, which is his parents and a sister. And then C, Hell World, which I believe he also has similar parents, but not the sister. But they're all different people, sort of, but mm-hmm. also the same. Yes. Okay. So, uh, in a really strange twist of fate, this author decided to include summaries in his book. So, <laughs> we went the lazy route and we figured we'd just read. Why not? To, yeah, I mean, there's no other reason for them to be there. So, yeah. sure. Um, so, anyway, we typically like to provide a plot summary of all the, you know, the main points in the book so that as we're talking about whether or not we liked it or what we liked about it or didn't, you at least have a general understanding of the story. So, okay, so the fir- so these first two summaries are actually the author's own words in the book. <laughs> all right. There's two separate summaries, but not a third one that wraps everything up at the end. So it's kind of two randomly midstream summaries yeah, of really, varying length. Honestly, really pissed me off. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so, but you know, right now it's saving me some time, so I'll take it. All right. Chapters 1 to 42 summary. Tom Barron lives in the world we were supposed to have. The technological utopia envisioned by the optimistic science fiction of the 1950s became possible when, in 1965, a scientist named Lionel Gottreider invented a radical new kind of energy production. Clean, robust, boundless. Fueled by the Gottreider engine, scientific advancement massively accelerated. In 2016, everyone has everything they need to live happy, comfortable lives. With all everyday functions automated or synthesized, most people work to develop the only thing that matters anymore. Entertainment. Like almost everyone else in the world, Tom works in a lab. His boss is his father, Victor Barron, a genius pioneer in a cutting-edge field. Time travel. The science itself is radical and brilliant, but to secure the corporate financing and government authorization to realize his experiments, Victor has packaged it as high-end tourism. Following the accidental death of Tom's mother, Rebecca Barron, Victor offers Tom a job out of guilt and pity. Their father-son relationship has long been strained because Victor was always so busy with his important research, and Tom was always so busy being a chronic disappointment. Tom is assigned to train alongside Penelope Weschler, the team leader of the first mission back in time, so he can take her place in the unlikely event that something insurmountable goes wrong with her. Tom soon falls head over heels for Penelope. He assumes she has no interest in him because she generally ignores him. But Penelope is much more troubled than anyone realizes. She's just very good at hiding him. The night before the mission, Tom and Penelope have a quiet encounter at a reception hosted by the project's financiers. They sleep together. It's kind of the best night of Tom's life. But the next morning turns into the worst day of Tom's life. At the routine pre-mission medical screening, Penelope finds out Tom got her pregnant, which automatically takes her off the roster. Since Tom is her official replacement, she accuses him of doing it on purpose. Victor, furious and embarrassed that his life's work has been threatened by his own son's irresponsible actions, lashes out at both of them and postpones the mission. Humiliated, her hard-fought professional accomplishments and tatters, Penelope does something horrible. She kills herself. The project is indefinitely shut down. The lab is abandoned until the legal mess can be resolved. In shock from grief about Penelope and churned up with anger at his father, Tom decides to complete the mission himself. 
he sneaks into the lab and activates the time machine. Once again, cha a summary from the author, chapters 44 to 54. Fueled by shock, grief, anger, and idiocy, Tom Barron uses his father's prototype time machine to travel from 2016 to 1965, just a few minutes before Lionel Gothrider first activates his world-changing invention, the Gothrider engine. Invisible to both eye and camera, in his agitated state, Tom neglected to render himself immaterial as well, so he's able to physically interact with his environment, which he soon does, accidentally, drawing the confused attention of Lionel Gothrider. Lionel's curiosity is interrupted by Ursula Francoeur, one of the celebrated 16 observers who witnessed Gothrider's experiment. They think they're alone, and so Tom learns something no one has ever discovered, that Lionel and Ursula are having an affair. The other 15 observers arrive, including Ursula's husband, Jerome, the government bureaucrat who approved Lionel's research and oversees his funding. Nobody in the room expects anything amazing to happen. Lionel runs some final calculations and notices something odd, a trace of a previously unidentified type of radiation. Tom realizes the radiation is coming from him. Because he's not immaterial, the energies he brought back in time with him are showing up on Lionel's instruments. Fortunately, the social pressure of the moment overrules Lionel's concerns. The future of his research rests on the experiment he's about to conduct, and any show of hesitation could fuel an already suspicious and resentful Jerome. He pulls up the lever to activate the engine. At first, all goes as it should. The device gets up to speed and starts pulling in massive amounts of energy, swirling plumes of glittering, silvery light arc wildly through the room, dazzling but harmless. And then one of the plumes hits Tom and disrupts his invisibility field. Only Lionel sees him, but of course it's shocking to see a ghost-like figure standing in his lab. In a panic, Lionel yanks the lever down, abruptly switching off the engine just as it hits full speed, unleashing torrents of energy. The device shudders into meltdown. The harmlessly sparkling plumes erupt into fiery blue spires of destruction, punching through the concrete walls, melting the steel support beams, nearly collapsing the ceiling onto them. Jerome bravely pushes his wife, Ursula, out of the way of a plume and has his arm seared off below the elbow. The rest of the observers try to claw their way to safety, but there's no escape. Lionel, closest to the overheating engine, starts to blister and burn. If it's not stopped, the meltdown will vaporize half of North America. Tom has no choice but to take action, shoving Lionel to safety. As the immense heat radiating off the device fries the circuitry of the time travel apparatus, activating the emergency return function that automatically propels him to his own time, he pulls up the lever to turn the engine back on before it's too late. Not knowing if his desperate final act worked, Tom disappears. <sighs> All right. Okay, now, now our addendum summary. Yes, yeah, so this Let's is... Finish this off. This is the rest of the book... Um, Tom wakes up in our reality in which he is known as John Barron. He's an architect of renown. He has a sister and his mother and father are in a loving relationship. Tom seems to be in control with John's memories swimming up from the depths at times to aid Tom with fitting into this new world. He finds Penelope who looks and acts different, but they nonetheless fall for each other. Tom tells Penelope and eventually his uh, family be what he has experienced. They're all concerned with various levels of belief. The next day, John takes over the body and essentially uh, assaults Penelope and sleeps with an intern at the architecture office. The day after that, Tom regains control and is horrified. Penelope says she can't be with him unless he proves his story is true. Tom sets out to find Gottsrider. He finds Jerome, who saw Lionel at Ursula's funeral under and learned his alias was Lionel Gray now. Tom is able to track him down to Hong Kong, where he discovers Lionel has been waiting for him to appear. Lionel has been inventing and refining his technology in secret, sometimes selling bits of it to the world in order to guide technological development purely to get Tom where he is now. He forces Tom to accompany him to his own time machine, a different type from Tom's father's, by showing him video of Penelope and Family B being kidnapped. Tom goes backwards in time 51 years, but in real time, only backwards. He has chained to the radiation signature of the original Gutsrider engine. In this purgatory, he comes to the realization that he must indeed convince Lionel to close the loop. Tom then travels back a few days earlier to the original experiment, has a mind fight with John himself and a third personality, Victor, who is from an apocalyptic timeline in which the Gutsrider engine melted down and obliterated a good portion of the Earth. Tom is able to use his mental aptitude to fight off John and Victor with various memories, most notably of his time with Penelope, and then fuse into Jump Tor at the last moment and make the original Tom turn the Gutsrider engine back on, preserving Reality B. 
Penelope and Reality B, of course, is pregnant with John Tor's child, and that made this whole thing worth it. Hooray! Yay! Yay! Wow! You know, love and children. I gotta say, his summaries were way too detailed, but somehow didn't cover all the important things, and I wish that I had realized <laughs> that before we used them for the episode. You know, just this is a way to show our listeners how much effort we put into the summaries. <laughs> The quality of our summarization is unparalleled, really. All right. I just talked a lot. Chris, can you start us off on the things that were good? Sure. And honestly, the first impression when you open this book is the writing is pretty good. Even great sometimes, I would say, which is perhaps what caused Luchek to pick this up after reading probably positive reviews for it. And I could see why people would have positive reviews for it. It's genuine and accurate for someone who's, you know, roughly in this age range of us. Like, you know, it's, I think Tom's supposed to be millennial-ish. I think, well, uh, he's he's supposed to be... Shit, I did the math, but he is in our age range. I mean, we're both 33 for reference, and I think he's supposed to be like 35 or 37 or something. So maybe yeah. maybe 40, but anyway, like... The language, kind of beside the point. Yeah, the language made sense for how old this person is supposed to be, I guess, was my point. Yes. Yeah. Descriptions are rich, world building is interesting, and well thought out. The way that people's failures and personalities are described is also pretty great. Pretty humanizing and nuanced takes on things. Tom, as a narrator, actually has a really good ability to see into emotional nuance of the people around him and of himself a lot of the times, which is kind of funny considering how stunningly mediocre he is and knows himself to be in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, I mean, most of Tom's personality is self-deprecating um, and, again, sort of, like, observing himself as mediocre and largely a failure in everything, except his ability to pick up on emotional nuance in himself and others, like I said, although he doesn't really realize that. I think, actually, he would have made a pretty good therapist in this world. I'm sure people wow, still really, therapy. Wow, you really get in there, huh? You're like, I think this guy should be a therapist. <laughs> I mean, you. What, what other skill set matches up with can detect emotional nuance in themselves and others? Well, I don't. God, okay, I don't want to get too off off the path here, but <laughs> I don't think he's that great at detecting it in uh, women he thinks he is in love with. <laughs> oh, sure, but I, I mean, he comes to that realization later often yeah, yeah that's like true. in the moment fucking sucks honestly yeah yeah not good at it but you're right in general in general not that therapists are out there like with perfect you know emotional insight into themselves and everyone around them you know no, therapists no. need therapy too just an aerobarose of therapy we're all trapped in there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a self-eating therapy circle yeah like you <laughs> you get on a call with your therapist and then when you're done you get on a call and you're therapizing someone else and then they're therapizing someone i don't know and eventually it leads back to your therapist who is then yes that, that's what it should be right <laughs> no no it no. All right, but back to the point on the writing. I really love a lot of the similes and metaphors and other comparisons that are made um, in this book, and that's my favorite kind of writing style. When you link two concepts together that I haven't considered linked before, and I have a nice tingly brain feeling moment of, oh yeah, that ca- I could see that comparison working. I, that makes sense. Um, it's true for nearly any kind of writing for me personally, whether it's yeah. novels, poetry, lyrics, even visual auditory mediums. I kind of love that feeling of two of neurons in my head that were previously unacquainted meeting up and liking each other a whole lot. Okay, so your neurons had a meet cute. That's what happened. Yes. Okay. That's not, right. Like when I, when that happens in my head when I'm reading your book, I enjoy it when you make comparisons that I never, um, I just never thought to make before. And I think honestly, to me, that's the crux of a lot of good art is showing you a perspective or an angle or a comparison that you hadn't thought of before. Yeah, I agree. Um. Sorry, I needed Chris to take the reins because I was parched. Uh, I'm back. Yes, I also feel this full way. Full of water. Full of- Wet and ready to go. I mean. <laughs> full of water. Um, yeah, I totally, I mean, some of that stuff was, were my notes. And I I feel like the way that Mastai, I hope I'm saying his name correctly. The way that the author uh, writes about, sort writes like inner monologues and even the dialogue between people, like, this is what writing about people should be like. This is how to do it. This was 
it was some of I think it was some of the best kind of like emotionally intelligent writing we've seen in a book that we've been asked to read. I can agree. Yeah. So for that reason, at the beginning, like Chris was saying, we first started reading it, we were like, oh, are we going to like this book? Uh, but you know, things things took a turn. We went to we went to, went to reality. C. things were bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, Chris, we have some examples. I I can go ahead and read them. Uh, we just wanted to pull out some examples of the writing that we found to be good. I expected to witness a momentous fault line in human discovery, dense with portent and grandeur, but it's scuffed up with careless infidelity and lame office politics and clammy sweat beating on the forehead that houses history's greatest mind. I reach for the lemon tart. It tastes the same as the ones from my world. Collapsing the boundaries between realities is too much for any pastry to bear. I reach for the wine bottle. It's one of those lines that made me laugh. Uh, (laughs) But I have a theory too. The accident doesn't just apply to technology. It also applies to people. Every person you meet introduces the accident of that person to you. What can go right and what can go wrong? There is no intimacy without consequence. He somehow found a spouse that would naturally wear herself down into a ball of gray wool. She became the comfortable downy socks that were always clean and ready in his drawer whenever his feet felt cold. I remember as a kid when I first understood that only half of every tree is visible, that the roots in the soil are equal to the branches in the sky that a whole other half is underground. It took me a lot longer, well into adulthood, to realize people are like that too. Well, those are five separate quotes or passages that we found that we highlighted as good examples of the way you should make these comparisons and just approach writing how you think about other people, like this sort of emotionally intelligent writing that you mentioned just a minute ago, Mm -hmm. Paris. Obviously, there's other styles that are like you don't have to write every single book out in the world like this, but by like meandering thoughts upon lemon tarts. Yeah, and right. Stuff but, like it, that. but it but it's works, not, it's, it, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the fact that you're able to take that lemon tart in the scene and put upon it the weight of nostalgia for another reality. That's a little connection right. that my brain hadn't made before. Pastry being responsible for reminding you of what could have been. Yeah, and I just think that the, that his um, comparisons tend to be rather like eloquent in a way. They have a sort of finesse about them that was pretty attractive. And we didn't pull any examples of dialogue, but I really feel like the dialogue was very super believable, like two people having conversations no matter what situation it was. I mean, and I guess that makes sense when you find out this guy's a screenwriter. Like, I'm really glad he didn't fuck that up because I would have been like, dude, what are you doing? Um, but I know. Yeah, no, dialogue was great. Like, so this is really the uh, this was one of the parts of the book that I was really happy with. Um, the next thing that I was like pretty happy with was actually the time travel science. I thought, for the most part, again, not entirely, it it pretty much worked for me. I'm one of those people who's like really critical about not, um, a, like when. Any sort of media is just like, yeah, time travel just happens. And it's like, come on, man. you got to give me something. It can't just... It's just the machine. It works. It's it's the Apple time machine. It just works. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. If it ever breaks, you're not going to be able to fix it. Um, Did you update the iOS into the latest version? It broke all the plugins for the time machine. And now you actually can't do the, the space variable anyway. So you're going to be blasted out into space unexpectedly. I'm sorry. It, the Apple Time Machine no longer supports clothes, so you're gonna have to travel in the nude now. The clothes plugin broke. Sorry. No, we're not gonna fix it. You have to get the new Time Machine. Okay. Now that we're would you t- like a seventy-five dollar adapter to connect to the clothing <laughs> hardware? <laughs> oh. All right. We're done shitting on Apple for now. Um. Yeah, I think the time travel science largely worked for me. Like, it feels well considered and explored, and it just made some sense, right? Like, I feel like almost every other time travel plot I've read or seen in a film considers fucking nothing. 
Uh, and I'm sure that there are some I haven't experienced that are good, but typically time travel is just not really thought out at all um, in any sort of media. I'm no, obviously, like, I'm no theoretical physicist or biologist or astronomer or whatever, but the time travel stuff feels like a good attempt to me. Uh, I think a, a great example that I can recall is the show Dark. So if you've ever, if you're interested in that, I think watching... All of it is essential. You have to watch it the whole series through the very last episode of season three for it to make any sense. Um, And Chris, you said Primer is a good example. I've never seen that. Yeah, kind of an older movie that it actually kind of makes use of the same real time but backwards time travel idea. Mm, mm. And people will use it to go back in time like a couple of hours to do a thing that messes with the timeline a couple of hours ago. And it always presents it as, well, when that happened, that always has happened. So it tries to preserve causality as much as possible in that in that way. It's a little confusing at first, and it, I don't think I still fully understand it, but it's just a really good example of trying to maintain that causality thing, which most other time travel stories, and even this one a little bit, has to kind of get a little murky with in terms of what time travel person affects what version of reality and how that relates to what happens next kind of stuff. Yeah, I just, I guess for me, it's like, I just want you to try. I just want you to try something out. Yeah, I want you to think this, about it a little one bit. tried really well. And yeah. what I enjoyed about it is that the time travel mechanics are wrapped up in how the plot works too. So I think having to follow the radiation signature of the original Gut Rider engine, which is how the... How uh, Tom's dad's time machine works is a pretty good way to solve the issue of, well, the Earth is moving through space at the same time. So if you time travel back in time, you have to compensate for that movement through uh, the void of space at the See, same time. See, that, is, is, that is the thing that I was so glad that this brought up because every... Every other time travel thing I've ever seen, like, never considers that you have to factor in the movement of the Earth in the void of space. Because we're always, we're we're not only, we're, like, spinning, we're on an axis, other things are spinning in on ax, axi, axes, axes. Um, so there's just a lot of things to consider. And then it also brings up something else I feel like a lot of time travel plots don't consider. And that's the effects on your like body your biology and how that has to also be considered and so yeah i just thought it was a good attempt man i was like yeah i'm happy about this this you thought about it great <laughs> time travel is never going to be completely 100 percent no. totally makes sense yeah i get it because obviously we haven't figured that shit out so yeah. if i don't think you know a screenwriter is going to unlock the fucking magic this is actually how time travel makes sense causality <laughs> breaker thing. i don't know maybe so you know <laughs> Who knows, yeah. man? Uh, weirder things have happened, but um, I, I will say that little little asterisk, little Paris a parasterisk here. Um, I actually thought the parasterisk a parasterisk, yeah. The time travel stuff in the towards the end of the book, I actually thought got really fucking dumb, and I was not happy about it. So, but like the overarching attempt was good, um, and yeah, I think I think actually. This doesn't happen a lot to me in books where I feel a moment of true horror, but when uh, John Tom is, like, going back in time with the the other, uh, the alternate time travel machine, not his dad's, but Goth Riders, and he realizes it's going in real time, I was like, I think I would rather kill myself than, like, <laughs> than like live through, yeah, live backwards we, in real time. Yeah, and obviously we've got a lot of that's the one that really Woo! doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of ways. So we'll have something to say about that time machine. Yes. Later. But the concept of being stuck and it's not like he could do anything to like once it's, it's like a set it and you're locked in it <laughs> sort of thing. So just being trapped going backwards in your own life for 51 years. Sounds... And then past the, uh, the amount of years you've even experienced. Right. Yet. Yeah. That, that actually sounds like true hell. I I thought that was uh yeah, just brilliantly horrific. Um Yeah, I think uh I was a little confused about the I well sorry, Chris, you were just alluding to this, so you can talk about it if you want, like how the causality or like the the sort of um 
linearness of the plot does i i don't know if that made sense in some ways like when the timelines cross because i'm like well how does the how does other how does tom john sorry god damn it how does reality b john have memories of reality a tom if they're supposed to be different timelines so that implies that like one timeline happened first and then the other timeline happened which is a little odd that's the crux of what sort of the biological stressor on people in this story too um i guess the idea is supposed to be that tom your consciousness is just a streamline of memories and events that are current you know you you store them in your long-term memory over time yeah and that is what defined yourself, your consciousness. So there was a Tom version of this that experienced the reality A utopia. Then there was the John consciousness that experienced the reality B that we live in. And at some point, because of time machine mechanics, the two consciousnesses collide at a certain point in 2016. And those two consciousnesses are basically vying for control over a single body which whenever one is in dominant control the other consciousness is experienced as vague memories perhaps like yeah things in your long-term memory that you could swear you'd never remembered which is i guess something that we experience in our day-to-day life so it's yeah it's a it's a way to link that feeling to what you experience normally and perhaps like oh i that false memory you have no that's just reality b chris he is the one that didn't unload the dishwasher. You don't understand. <laughs> yeah, try to tell Tris that next time you <laughs> fuck up the dishes. It was, it was Chris A. It was Chris A. Um, but no, I think, yeah, so I think the thing to remember that is not explicitly stated is that the timelines are not parallel. This is not parallel universe. This is because Tom went back in time, he caused... A branching which happened after reality a already existed so yeah so it's a little weird right because normally i think we think about these things as parallel but in this case they are not parallel they're a little they're a little off kilter or maybe they're they're parallel but they don't start at the same point right so tom is really the only linking piece between Correct. them because he has that unbroken consciousness of yeah. memory right um, but anyway, it was, you know, I thought it, they yeah, did an okay job dealing with dealing with that. Um, another, sorry, this is just kind of a list of things. Uh, I really love that the author consistently grinds on the point that our world, which is reality B, is a fucking sad shambles in every way. It's just like, I cannot believe, like, the United States in 2016 is this. And it's like, yeah, man, wait till you get to 2022. <laughs> We could have been so much better is basically the idea here. Yeah. Um, I do like Greta, who is Tom's sister from Reality B, or I guess John's sister. Yes. Is how we should yes. put this here. Uh, she's kind of the stand-in mouthpiece for you optimist dickheads think it could have been just fine if we had unlimited energy. And she's actually, that was, ne- she's the type that's like, that was that would never be possible. I don't, I can't even conceive of this reality. Yeah. Um, and I kind of liked having that there because there's some stuff about the utopia reality that I didn't really Yeah, worry. we'll like, talk about that in a minute. <laughs> that, yeah, we're, we'll get to that kind of stuff there. I did enjoy having Greta be in there being like, reality A was never an option. I don't understand how, like, that's why I don't believe you, John, is because... No matter what, <laughs> I don't think it even makes sense to me in in my world. Yeah, humanity is not capable of empathy at that level, basically. Yes. Um, this is, okay, so this is something that is like a maybe not... I wasn't sure if this was good or bad. I think I was thinking about this in light of all of the books we've read where the descriptions were like horrible, racist, misogynist caricatures of people. And um, in this book, we just get almost... Almost no descriptions of anyone. The only time we get descriptions is, like, when someone is horny, which is hilarious uh, <laughs> to me. And, and I guess of, sort of appropriate, though, right? Like, you're well, yeah, really extra yeah. focusing on people's physical features when it's time to get bonked. But even then, it's very mild. It's like, oh, man, she has an ass, man. I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Just generally you know, noticing like, the fact of ass. Is, is I mean, enough. that is kind of what happens, which which 
made sense to me and seemed appropriate for someone being like, oh, yeah, that person looks good, you know, instead of what we normally. <laughs> is, that, is that your horny monologue in your head, Paris? Oh. <laughs> is that what it sounds like? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I just, I was just, just sounds like creepy, creepy man voice. Um, <laughs> That's your horny voice. Okay, I, I, uh, but I would still rather that than what we typically see, which is her breasts were huge and perfect above her tiny, perfect waist atop her slim, perfect hips with bones jutting out at perfect angles. Like, I'm really glad that we didn't get that because I was worried for a minute. I was a little worried. Cons- especially considering what this whole story revolves around, which is Tom's crush on Penelope. Right, right. You know, and and I don't know, in my mind, I was like, I was like, ah, do I feel like this is bad because we're not getting a lot of descriptions? But I was like, no, I think this might actually be a good thing because A, we avoid, you know, some of that horrible shit like I was talking about. And B, you know, the reader gets to kind of imagine the characters as, as they wish. And I, I thought, I felt like it worked for this book. There are other books where I would say, no, you need to fucking describe people to me. But in this book, it didn't... I don't think it really would have benefited from any kind of long-winded physical description. So this worked. Worked of for this course, book. especially since it's such an emotionally yes. invested piece of writing. Exactly. Where that's the focus instead of the physical features of people. You know, uh, the book we read two books ago, the hentai thing, you're probably going to want to describe some physical features. Yeah, because you... You, you're trying you yeah you're trying to get trying get, to get people, people horny you're trying to activate right. the oh yeah you've got it you've got it nice butt. <laughs> trying to do your horny voice but i don't know just... <laughs> i don't know why it sounds like this is this is my horny voice <laughs> I, I guess it sounds like to me a decrepit oscar the grouch like so past the point of euthanasia i've been in this can like, too long yeah, exactly like really? anything will do at this point Oh, the mailman's turned turned <laughs> over again, or pending over again. <laughs> oh God, let's not create horny Sesame Street characters. I oh, don't... you know that that has already been created. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to get we get <laughs> oh. recommended that hentai. Yeah, oh. I, I really feel like reading the porn book was a mistake because now I saw yes. so many people being like, "Oh, you'll read porn." I'm like, "No, we don't want no, to." Please, God, no, please, God, please, please, no. Uh. Like, hey, you okay. want to donate, like, a little pile of money to us every more, any, every month? We'll consider it. But, like, not on the regular people. Not on the regular. <laughs> In fact, the price for porn continues to go up every time someone asks for more porn. <laughs> we should, there should be a porn tax. We should have, like, all right, if your book has more than one <laughs> sex scene, it's twice as much to read. <laughs> it's this, that's the porn tax. <laughs> Uh, anyway. All right, just rethinking the Patreon midstream here. Let's continue on <laughs> with the things that were good. Uh, anyhow, uh, next point I, I felt was good was that I thought the pacing was pretty good until the two-thirds mark of the book. That's when I, I really fucking lost steam about there. The but... chapters are really short, but it kind of makes sense for this one. Usually I'm down on very, very short chapters. Oh, no, but... I like them. It does make it a point to have each chapter be a specific idea or concept that is to be talked about, and then oh. we move on to the next main idea in the next chapter. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I thought it worked really well in this book. It, uh, the short chapters, like you said, they were, they were focused enough that they kept, they kept the reader, like they kept me interested either emotionally or plot wise, and that made me want to continue. And when you make short chapters, you know, sometimes it incentivizes your reader to keep going because they you're giving them a little bit of accomplishment, you know? Um, and it worked for me until I got to maybe the last 70 pages and then I just, I I was not happy anymore. Mm-hmm. But in, in general, the pacing was good for most of it. Um, weirdly, this was a surprise for me, the humor in this book worked for me. I actually laughed out loud. I actually laughed at that lemon pastry thing because i was just like i don't know collapsing realities into a lemon tart was funny because the rest of that conversation was like pretty emotionally intense and then it's like i don't know i really stuff like that works for me but again i think this is maybe just a me flavor thing Um, honestly that's the flavor of a lot of douglas adams writing and i really think you gotta read hitchhiker's guide i know i'm sorry i'm really behind on that i've not read that uh but yeah i really 
I liked, I thought some of the jokes were good and they were, they just reminded me of jokes I would make. So they gave me a laugh and I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting this book to be funny at all. So that was good. All right. Um, I think we already talked. Okay. So we can move to things that were bad, perhaps. Yeah. And this, I mean, we'll get to the ultimate judgment later on, but this was a tough book for me to truly decide like or no like, but there sure are a lot of things in here that no like, and my main problem with it can be summarized as the detail work on this, the sentence-to-sentence writing is really good and makes you want to continue reading, but then as soon as you step back and examine the larger plot picture that we're painting here, it's like if you were, like, we're looking at you know, an ancient mural with, like, beautiful artwork on it, and your face is right up against it, so you can see all the, like, tiny brush strokes that are done so well. And then you step back from it, and you realize it's a giant wall that's just, like, a stick figure dog taking a shit. (laughs) And every line in it is, like, part of that, like, intricate writing or, like, hieroglyphs or something like that that's really amazing when you, like, look at that line... That makes up the dog's squiggly tail. Oh, wow. It's all just like a bunch of flowers that are so artfully done. And then you step back and it's just a curly cue with a piece of poop coming out the back. Dude, that's going to be like what we ultimately figure out Stonehenge is. Like just some elaborate, <laughs> stupid fucking joke. It's actually the balls of a giant dick that they were trying to create. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I agree um, because, all right, things that were bad, the thing... This, I mean, and this was bad for both me and Chris. We're still, we're still in straight cis male territory here where our default main character is the hero and he's on his journey and he must get the girl and save the world because he's the only one who can. (sighs) It's, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm so sleepy and heavy with the weight of seeing the motivation of, but I thought girl was hot. And I wanted to make baby with her as the central axis upon which all things in reality itself is turned upon. (laughs) Yeah, the the central axis around which three realities were were brought together. Like, yeah, I mean, oh, I... Yeah, I don't know, man. You're, I thought yeah, this was a parody of that kind of thinking at Me first. Me too. Because Tom is so upfront about, like, I'm a shitty guy yes. that had deserves nothing and fail all the time. And I'm doing something stupid to get a girl that I've known for a couple of months and talked with a handful of times and slept with once. And I thought it was going to turn into some kind of parable yeah, about yeah. how that is a boneheaded way to think about things and you're going to undo the fabric of reality and screw everyone over if you keep thinking that way. But it was not. It was not. No, no, you get rewarded for doing that. You get rewarded because, yeah. Especially <sighs> when you have, um, okay, so Tom's dad here, he's, his motivation was the one that I wanted to see more about, where he's just all about, I just want to build a time machine, dude. I'm, a, I'm one of the greatest scientific minds out here. This is my character motivation for doing everything that I do. I was so much more interested in that. And what is the worst thing about this book is that Lionel isn't even that. Lionel in reality B should have been like Tom's dad in reality A. That would have been a much better motivation where he's just like, I just want to be the Time Lord that made everything because I'm the smartest guy and I can have control over everything because I can manipulate fucking time. Uh, but you Much see, more interesting. But you see, we must tie everything together with, but I like the lady and the sex Because he the also lady. liked the fucking lady. Yeah. The greatest scientific <laughs> mind is also doing time travel to hide an affair. It's a lot of steps, yes. bro, yes. To, to hide in a fa- There's a much simpler route. There is a much simpler route. I mean, I guess Ursula was just that good, man. I don't know. I don't get it. Okay, but Paris, do you have to... So the the, the plan they come up <laughs> oh, with no, it's is, so okay, it's so Ursula bad. is going to go somewhere <sighs> and wait for three or four hours to make sure her husband doesn't show up. And then she will contact Lionel, and then he'll time travel back that many hours Correct. to where she is, and then they can fuck for that p- 
period of time and cuddle and do all that stuff to guarantee that Jerome won't ever find out. Bro, there are much easier ways to guarantee yeah. Jerome won't be physically present yeah. than fucking traveling backwards through time and messing with the biology of the woman you love. Yeah. So, um, you know what didn't occur to Rent me? Rent a hotel a couple of cities away. Wait till Jerome's on a business trip. Yeah. Um, you know what didn't occur to me until just now? Oh, yeah? So, Lionel goes back in time to be with her. Why does that cause her to have brain cancer? She's not going anywhere. It's because her memory is dual. Now oh, because right. Her she... memories are getting overwritten and it broke her brain. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yes. Yes, that does make sense. Okay. That's a problem with Lionel's time machine, but not Tom John Victor's. Because he's also dealing with memory rewrites, but he doesn't have, like, instant brain cancer from a longer memory rewrite. It's like the amount of times you do it is what triggers it. And since Ursula and Lionel were doing it a lot, yes, that's what triggered the brain cancer for her. But since Tom just did a big one one time, that's not as bad. Yeah, that was kind of, that's part of the time travel stuff that we didn't love. Uh, I don't know how much sense that makes. Um, anyway, we kind of went off on a little rant here. Uh, let's let's get back on track. So, for no, me... I'm continue ranting at every one of these points, Paris, yes, so prepare I, yourself. Oh, I know. But yeah, I, I agree with this whole, the, the larger sentiment we were getting at here is that for me, this whole thing like started to derail between page like 60 and 80 when I realized that it was all a setup for a lame romance where, you know, typical ma- male main character thinks he's in love with his coworker he slept with once and makes it his whole personality. And I was like, fuck me. This, you know, like Chris was saying, I thought this was also going to be a different take on that, like a, re- a reversal of that trope. But no, just... Just a different way to get to the same it's destination. All, I can unwrite human utopia just because I really like Penelope. Yeah. So that's, that's It's all worth it. I mean, it only exists in my mind, so therefore. Yeah. Um. I really want to push back against Tom, John Tor, you know, John Tom loving Penelope because in reality, he was just intrigued by a woman that he worked with for three months. And the only reason I think he kind of held on to it is because she did to him what he had done to other women, which is just sleep with them once and then toss them, right? So because she slept with him once and was like, oh, I don't really care. I'm just kind of, my brain is just kind of a mess and I hate myself and I just run around and have unprotected sex with random dudes. This is what I do because I'm broken inside. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing I guess we can say. We'll get that, to that in a moment. Yeah. Um, and like, I, you know, so to me, I don't think he can really be in love with her. He has a crush on her and kind of got obsessed with the idea of possessing her and It turns into quote unquote love when he finds out that he impregnated her and he's like, she's carrying my child. And I was like, oh, fucking God. Uh, I that really that really sucked. I mean, it's literally the day after because, you know, this is like future world. So they can detect instant pregnancy tests. They can detect that. You know, I mean, it made sense with the level of technology available in this world. But yeah, yeah, they could detect that she had been impregnated. And I'm just like. Dude, this guy is so progressive in every other way, but then he's like, my baby, my woman. It's like, (laughs) dude, she did not give a fuck about you. That is not a child yet. Also, like, maybe talk to her about it before you just decide you're in love with her and want to save her. Like, you know what she does? She offs herself. She dematerializes herself in the lab. (laughs) That's, That's how much she gave a shit about him. Like... Even Lionel calls him out on it when he's like, you knew her for a couple of weeks, and I agreed with him 100%, but Lionel's out here undoing the fabric of (laughs) space-time. Oh, my love is purer. I know. No, mine makes sense, you see, because I had more sex with her more often, therefore it's justified. Yeah. I mean, I understand how... I understand a little bit more how Ursula and Lionel got together because... I think they also knew knew each other for a shorter period of time, but they were like, but they were, but she seemed to understand, I don't know how to explain this, but like, 
I know she wasn't also wait what she, I'm sorry I'm having a I'm having a bit of a bit of confusion about this she wasn't this also Paris a scientist Paris B's memory is coming into your oh, where no. she read the alternate it's all it's, our it's Tara my my B reality self <laughs> uh, but I'm sorry I forgot if Ursula was indeed she was a scientist as well yeah because she was going to conferences yes. and say, yeah so yes. so I can understand their relationship developing over several months because she understood his research actually helped him like fill out paperwork and stuff like yes they were way more enmeshed in this goal whereas yes. john tom or whatever was given this job by his dad because his dad felt bad for him and he only put him on the mission because he was like well you're never going to be the one to time travel so this doesn't yes. actually matter you're just supposed to be be this be penelope's understudy but i don't actually expect you to succeed and so he was just like fumbling the whole time and she was teaching him things. And, you know, I'm not saying that 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 can't work, but it is so clear in the writing that Penelope is not into this dude beyond like a one night stand because it's just what she does. I just I don't know how you can be so invested in someone who is not giving you anything in return. Like no indication that she has gives a single quarter of a shit about him, you know? Ugh. A lot of people will latch on to anything. And I agree with your point about Lionel and Ursula being more justified, I guess. Yeah, I'm not... Really being in love. But at the same time, still a shitty motivation oh, I to agree. fuck with space-time and a lame pillar to place this story upon. When you have who is supposed to be the greatest scientific mind ever doing everything, again, just for... For more sexy times with Lady. Yeah, and I think I think it would it would be understandable if if we were talking about somebody who had lost you know, lost the person they deeply loved that they had developed a relationship with over a longer period of time. Like I and they didn't exist anymore. I could understand that. But one is like a weird misplaced crush, and the other one is like, bro, you both are in the same timeline. Like, just, just <laughs> schedule just it out, normally. man. Schedule it. Or even like Lionel. Lionel would rather invent time travel <laughs> than just go to Jerome and be like, bro, I gotta let you know something. Well, it's not. It's not Lionel. It's Ursula who doesn't want to. Who doesn't want to admit to the affair. I suppose that, but like, even still, I still feel like as Lionel, that would have been the easier path. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I mean, <laughs> and look, like, we're not, you know, it's not like we don't understand that people are complicated, but it was just a bummer to see this book written in service to the idea that, like, woman and baby make, make bending time worthwhile. <laughs> the whole reason for being it alive. It doesn't, though. It doesn't, though. <sighs> um... That's the other thing. Yeah, like like you just said, I don't like it when media pushes the idea of having a partner is the th the reason to be the reason oh, to and exist a child. is to a, and a child and a child is to that's the reason to exist and be out here doing being human things at all. Yeah, any of that. It's all in service to the grand god of someone is willing to share a bed with me. And perhaps procreate or adopt a child and raise a family with me. That's not the only possible human motivation for existing out here. Yeah. There's yeah. many, a myriad other things we could do. And like, like I mentioned before, just being a really great scientist or developing your skills so you're elite at something. Right? Like, yeah. I... <laughs> I, why don't I read more stories about that type of person? Or even just someone who's really motivated, like, I'm going to cross the fucking time streams just so I can see what kind of food they have. I the was just going to say, I want alternate dimension watermelon. That's my motivation. Like, what other... Because it even mentions in the book that hip-hop and punk rock didn't exist in reality A. Right. So what kind of shit is going on over there? What kind of sounds are they making over oh, there? Oh yeah, there's no what's rap. Your there's what's no your rap hardware synth set up, bro? What's your modular yeah. setup in fucking Utopia Reality A where energy is unlimited and I could run 15 million oscillators at the same time right. and as many plugins as I want? It's amazing. Actually, Chris, you would then go to that reality and become some kind of villain. Some kind of patch cable <laughs> villain. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Fear I, me. I've become the mega oscillator. 
Well, and I think I would also be more amenable to a romance plot. Like I said, if it was about kind of like a really deeply held, you you know, love that was lost or um, love that was maybe uh, not societally approved, you know, like we have like queer characters or something pursuing that. Like, I would, I would understand that more. But, like, fuck it. Yeah, because it's not like they had to hide from anyone except Jerome. Yes. Jerome is the only person that this affair must be kept secret from. Just this one guy's knowledge of that affair is causing them to do this wild shit. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, now that we've yelled about that for a while, now we can yell about something else. Um, so sure. I think we already said this earlier. The summaries that we actually read for the uh, plot summary earlier, I laughed out loud in not in a positive way because uh, I was like, this is ridiculous that you would put summaries in the middle in the middle of your book. And like Chris said earlier, they weren't even spaced out. They were just like... Two kind of in the in the early middle of the book and then nothing else? It was just <laughs> I I didn't understand. Was this some kind of screenwriter impulse? You gotta have the previously yeah. on <laughs> all our wrong todays up in here? Like I'm go like he calculated exactly where people were most likely to put the book down or something? I don't know. I mean, unless this was like an editor suggestion where the editor was like, yo man, people are too stupid, you gotta summarize this shit. But then my like, which, fine. I mean, I personally... No, not fine. No, I disagree. Yeah, it's not fine. I don't think this is a book that needed summaries. I, no. It seemed totally... Not that complicated. No, it seemed totally unnecessary and, like, weirdly infantilizing as the reader. I was like, fuck off. Um, and then also to, to just... Furthermore, like, if you are going to put these in your book because you're worried that people aren't going to follow your plot... Um... I mean, one, can you maybe edit differently so that it's more understandable? But two, if you are going to provide summaries, provide consistent summaries. Because let me tell you, if people were confused at the beginning, they probably didn't finish this book because the end is a fucking mishmash of shit happening in three different timelines. Like, if anything, wouldn't you need some at least one more summary towards the end somewhere? Like, I just. (sighs) It's the dropping of it midway through after only two summaries where the back half of the book occurs that's really mystifying to me yeah i mean there and also the summaries are pretty close together there's a summary um for chapters 43 and then 44 to 54 is what you said before so it's like okay here's 40 chapters of summary and here's 10 and then there's 137 chapters so from (laughs) from chapter 56 on you're on your own good luck (laughs) you figure it out bitch figure it out uh, yeah, so I don't know. That just felt odd. I don't know that we've ever read a book with random summaries in it. Have we, has that happened? Before? I'm actually, actually, wait, no, Tara, Reality B Tara is, is tingling. Uh, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like this has happened once before, but I think it was a substantially shittier book that had something like this. But I don't know. I'm sure listeners yeah, would remember better than I do. The aether. Yeah, it's all sp- okay. sucked into Reality C at this point. Um, <clears throat> All right. Well, Paris, I would like to have my moment in the spotlight here. I know I've been ranting already quite a bit, but this next thing is the biggest thing that made me aggravated in, in oh, the whole this book. Is and great. it was pretty early on. So good. And I think originally when I was talking about it with you, you kind of pushed back on it and said, well, that kind of does make sense in some ways. And I will admit, like, I understood the point about how the, Tom's dad is kind of crux to this point here and how his motivation to be petty could perhaps be doing all this but i just don't buy it outweighing his drive to have this experiment go off anyway so as we mentioned in the summary penelope gets pregnant and thus because of the biology of being pregnant changing her body a little bit that makes it hard for her or more difficult or more risky for her to do the time traveling uh impossible i think actually it's not really thoroughly explained why that is. It's just accept that whatever. I'm no, not, no, that's not even what I'm reading. No, no, no. They, I mean, they explain that like they're they have to know their exact biology, and that it can't 
compensate so much. I don't know because of they have to they have to take into effect like take to take into account the movement of the Earth and then also everyone's kind of biological shit so that they don't I don't know accidentally pop a blood vessel or something. I think that's kind of the the gist, right? Okay, sure, but I don't even really think that's a great explanation. But besides okay, the point okay. of what I'm getting to here, so reality A Victor, Tom's dad. A little confusing there. There's reality C Victor, who is Tom from another reality, but there's also reality A Victor, who is Tom's dad. Hinges his entire career and legacy on this one missioning happening on a specific date, and you don't screen people that you're sending back in time. By asking them if they're willing to accept at least temporary sterility for the mission's sake, if that throws off your ability to time travel, that's not part of the screening process at all. This is just left to chance. Yeah, don't worry about it. You don't want to, like, you know, make your fucking time stronauts, chrononauts, excuse me, um, you know, just commit to sterilization because this is a huge scientific development. It would be you know, uh, disastrous, clearly, if someone got pregnant. Uh, here, here's the other thing. Okay, sure. You're like, okay, maybe we don't want to ask our chrononauts to be sterilized, but, like, they literally have, like, instant abortion on demand. So why not, why not, why Penelope not just get instant abortion, then recalculate in a few days... That's what I was going to say. Even if yes, that's sorry. the oversight, even if you let that through, you don't, I'm, I'm, you know, that's fine. Don't feel, put your points in too. Even if that's the oversight, when it all goes down, there's a sentence about how Victor needs it to happen on that specific date for aesthetic re- Like, oh, it's the it's, 50 year anniversary. Yeah. It has to happen then, which I, yeah, is I also know. stupid. I think the idea is like, oh, it's a world where everyone only everyone only cares about entertainment, so like it has to be perfect. But I also think that's a very weak it, argument. The thin justification you if time travel was being tested and they were like, well, we actually gotta wait a couple of months just to make sure that I don't know, the co- the time stronaut co- chrononaut doesn't get spaghettified on the way back, I think I'd be willing to wait a couple extra months, regardless of if it's lining up with the perfect fiftieth anniversary date. Which, right. again, doesn't make sense. It's not like there needs to be investors. We're post-capitalism here, post-resource scarcity here. So what is Victor scared of aside from just, oh, it feels nicer when it lines up on that day? If you're hinging, again, your entire legacy on this, I don't think you would care that much about the date that it happens as long as it does happen. And, again, they could just postpone the mission a couple months, check Penelope's biology to make sure she's still drift-compatible or whatever this is. <laughs> Okay, even if that, even if that, okay, so we're too even yeah. deep here. <laughs> then just send your son who was specifically in here to be the stand-in, which is the whole reason he got to know Penelope, right? If it's that important, just send him back. And I know you're going to come at me here, Paris, with, well, he didn't like his son. He thought he was a fuck up and Tom actually didn't really learn anything. Yes, true. Absolutely. He right. didn't actually want him to send him on the time mission true. backwards. But if it's so important to your legacy and there's five other people on the mission anyway, just send him back there. And okay, okay, another point from there. It's like, oh, it must be six people is is some sentence in the book See, because psychologists have yeah, determined. So I didn't pick that pick up on that at all, and you did. There was a sentence about how psychologists determined that six people is the ult, uh, the optimal grouping for time travel back in time. And that's it. It doesn't say why. So, I mean, I guess I'm supposed to swallow that shit. But it just says optimal. It doesn't say 100% necessary. So even if you don't, even if Penelope can't go back, even if Tom can't go back, send the suboptimal group of five back on that day and you'll still have your legacy. And I, so in the whole preparation is so that in case something goes wrong, they can hit the, oh shit, we got to go back button. And it seems like that's a one person job. So you're not going to tell me that you need a five person redundancy to do that job or even just survive wherever they end up if they get sent somewhere different. It's not, I, it, it's never said that they're learning six different possible timelines or yeah, past periods yeah, of living yeah. or anything like that. Just send the fucking five people back or just send your son back 
or even even swap in one of the other five understudies. Yeah. That could have also have slotted in. Yeah, I don't because... understand why each understudy has to be to that specific person. Yeah, because I, I also... So first of all, thank you, because I missed that point that the number six, the six-person team was fucking arbitrary. It's not like a space mission where they're all experts in certain things. This was... This is just... I don't know. Psychology says six people, good. It's like, I'm sure five would be fine. Or like you said, just use one of the other alternates because, again... Yes, they all had to learn things, but they were all learning the same things. It's not like they e- it's not like one was a physicist and one was a doctor. Like it was just you know, one was the yellow power ranger and one had the power of the mastodon and Right, one, you know, like, right. And like we need the tusks to like fuse or whatever. <laughs> um but yeah, it so I agree with you in that it doesn't it seems really yeah. It's a flimsy Seems- tower upon which to balance your I fucked up the timeline thing. And mm-hmm. you don't even really need that is the thing to still have the same plot device. Very true. It could have just been Tom's mad Penelope didn't end up liking him after the one night stand. Mm-hmm. And maybe even, you know, she does get rid of the child in her in her womb. And that's what causes Tom to be the first. He like out of spite because he's so mediocre and shitty. He goes and uses the time machine before Penelope can because he really knows she wants to be first. Yeah, and I I cannot believe that that isn't what happened in the book. Like, I can't believe it was like... I think because that would make Tom unequivocally evil and shitty and you can't have that be the motivation. No, I don't sympathize think, with him at the end. I don't think it would make him unequivocally. It would just make him shitty and then he would have to grow as a character through the rest of the book, which, I'm sh- which we get anyway. Um... Yeah. yeah, it would have been a better motivation if he realized, wow, I did a really fucked up thing because I just can't self-analyze yeah. enough to understand that that's a shitty thought to have. Yeah, and I wow. Would rather... I shouldn't, I shouldn't want to, I shouldn't base my whole identity on like wanting to own a woman because I accidentally impregnated her. Like, wow, let me develop as a man. <laughs> Just, nah, man. nah, nah, nah. Let's write the story about ha- getting the girl and having the kid at the end. No. That's that's the important thing to do here. Yeah. Okay. So that's my that was my big problem with the book, and that's when I started seeing things that I didn't enjoy in the plot there. So that's that that's my rant there. I mean, you. I see at least three other sub rants uh, in the notes from you, but I can take those sure. rants. I can take those rants. Uh, you know what? I, I got the energy going. Why don't I like the sub rant to that? Is Penelope lost out on her chance to be an astronaut because of weird brain chemistry stuff, which they also wouldn't have checked before you get sent into the shuttle into space. Well, that was a plot point I think before. they said. I think that was explained by it wasn't something you could test for, and it was so rare that. I mean, there was nothing they could really have done. It was just a horrible, you know, horrible luck of the fucking genetic draw. Sure. But even, again, even then, you, someone who has had this horrible dream ruining thing happen to you one time and who clearly does not want children, don't just go get your tubes tied to guarantee the chrononaut thing goes well. Your impregnation fetish is that strong? Your unprotected sex yes. fetish is that strong? Yes. That you were willing to risk that a second time. Yes. Okay. I mean, I mean, Chris, people don't always do do things logically. And I understand that that's a lot of what this book is getting at. But yeah, I mean, it just I I just can't imagine it outweighing that that crucial character motivator because it's not it's not like Penelope is presented as like turbo slut that has to sleep with a bunch of people all the time and that's like a fundamental pillar of who she is right it's a small character flaw that you think yeah. would probably get some consideration if it already like if something that left up to chance fucked your shit up one time yeah and especially since you know she ultimately kills herself over it you would that to me is the final nail in this plot coffin where it's like well if her getting pregnant and derailing this experiment is enough for her to end her to dematerialize her fucking self then it doesn't make sense right that she would have risked that i I, (sighs) and i'm being a little bit silly here when i say impregnation fetish because that's not at all mentioned in the text it's just that she likes to have unprotected sex with men sometimes and hey you could do that without jeopardizing your chrononaut career. 
Yeah, you live in if, the future, man. Like, if. <sighs> okay. Okay. Also, hey, utopian future. Why are why are men not automatically snipped? Also agree. I just feel like also that's agree. that's the logical version. Like, Listen, if we're man, truly in technological utopia, like if we're doing circumcisions at birth, an irreversible process. Then the vasectomy down the line, a reversible process, shouldn't be that wild. Yeah, it's uh, pretty easy to uh, give give men vasectomies young. And then, you know what? When they're ready to have kids, they just get it reversed. Ta-da! You can freeze some sperm. Like, to me, that was a flaw in this, in this utopian world. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it was like... Why is this still, like, the, the lady's responsibility? Um, anyway... <clears throat> future Chris here with a reminder that we pre-record these episodes and didn't know that what we'd be talking about in this episode would line up with real serious changes affecting real people in the US when we talk about a utopia where everyone gets a mandatory vasectomy we weren't considering that outside of the joke we were making in the context of the book we were reviewing we understand that in real world practice that could be problematic especially for BIPOC folks who have faced state sponsored sterilization Please know that we support y'all and are actually recommending that the U.S. government take away your bodily autonomy. Huge Chris out. Yeah, uh, okay, I guess this is a good time to warn people. We got to talk about some assault here. So um, this is something we, I think I had a particular issue with with this book. So there's a point in the book where um, Victor and John take over Tom's consciousness in John's body. And he, uh, I, I want to go ahead and say he rapes an intern and rapes Penelope. I'm and, gonna agree with you there. Yeah, and um, uh, and again, I'm using I'm using that word because based on the text in in the book, it is clear that that is what happened. Uh, in the case of the intern, she was like entire bottles of wine drunk, you know, clearly not capable of consent. Um. And he was violent with her and with Penelope. With Penelope, she's actually sleeping when he pounces upon her. Um, and the way that the shame and trauma is described by both women, it's very clear that that they were sexually assaulted. This wasn't... This is not... And, and, you know, to be fair, the book doesn't take it lightly either. But I took issue with it because I was like, look, man, why... This didn't need to be in there. Like, Like, I understand if... If you're writing a book and, you know, somehow sexual assault or rape is critical to the plot, like, obviously, th- we have read other books that were that were good where uh, I-, I can think of Young God, where those things were present. Swamplandia. Swamplandia, also. right, because they served the story, um, they served, they served the narrative and... There was really no other way to tell that story because those stories were about women that went through that. I mean, and it. Um, but this story, like when you're using sexual assault literally just to be like, oh, this character evil, though, it's just kind of like, come on, man, you know, like it's another done... overdone thing, and yeah. you can just be more creative in your ways. To characterize a time-traveling bee consciousness as an evil person. Right. When they take over your body. And I guess the whole idea was, I'm assuming, that he wanted to make it so extreme that it would cause, you know, a rift between him and Penelope. But, like, why... Why both assaults, then? Could we just have one assault? Why do we need two back to back? Like it's just I even I just quite again, like I think I think a lot of times we have people who listen to the show and they don't pick up on quite pick up on the nuance of what we're saying, and so I will try to be better at explaining this, but we're not saying you can never have rape or sexual assault in media. We're saying that it is a topic that should be handled with a lot of care. And just like when you're using, like, racial slurs or, you know, or, like, or stuff like that, it's, like, there's got to be the the reason that you use it has to outweigh putting the reader through having to read it, right? Like, 
like I, I will say at least this author didn't go into super graphic detail. I thought that the sort of the descriptive handling of it was acceptable, but I, I question whether it even needed to be in there at all, because there are plenty of other ways where we could show that, you yeah. know, John Victor is an irredeemable asshole. He could have, I don't know, punted My a Pomeranian or like, just, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, sorry, I don't, <laughs> uh, obviously, obviously I don't want it's a real dickhead. He wandered onto the construction site and he just had to get him the fuck out of it. But my beef with it lies in the fact that we see this a lot in media of just using yes, exactly. the sexual assault of a woman as a tool to characterize someone as evil, as just like the easy mm-hmm. go-to mechanic. It's always the catalyst. Um, and then furthermore, like, he could have just cheated on Penelope with the intern. Why did it have to be rape? Why did he have to rape the intern and then rape Penelope? He could have, you know, shitty. the shitty version of him could have just had an affair. And I feel like that would have been enough to break them up. <laughs> like, I I don't know why it needed to be compounded so hard. I I don't. Yeah, again, to be clear, the, the problem we have with this is not the presence of this at all in any kind of media. Correct. <laughs> it's just, it's context with the fact that it appears in a lot of other media, right? Like, we can't always judge, people kind of want you to judge a book purely in its own island as if it like it, there's no other media that exists around it right, and you don't right. have to take that into account but that's just not all art is defined by what the person that made the art has as context yeah you we, can't escape that we're trying to have a society here people we live <laughs> in a world we don't live in vacuums um but anyway i guess i i will reiterate the one point of success about this even though i was disappointed by it overall was that the assault was not graphic or lingering, and I thought it was treated with some level of care, even though I really question its presence in this particular work for this purpose. Okay, we can move on now. So I earlier I mentioned earlier that I was having a really hard time in maybe the final like 70 pages. I mean, this was pretty long to begin with. It was almost 400 pages, right? It was like three, yeah. 380 or something. It took me about four and a half hours. Oh, it took me eight. How how do you Damn. read? How did you read that twice as fast as I did? I mean, that could possibly be the uh, catalyst for the miscommunication that we had <laughs> in a previous discussion. Yeah, I think I think sometimes Chris skims and sometimes chooses the wrong point to skim. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed, happens to us all. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, I yeah, I spent an entire day reading this book. I sat on the porch and read it all day. Uh, and took my notes simultaneously, so maybe that's why. I think I think overall it was like nine hours of work. A sacrifice um, of a Tuesday to Terrible. It was a Saturday. It was a beautiful, oh, the even more delicious. Uh, it was a beautiful Saturday, too. Was Saturdays nice are so delicious. Yeah, I really feel like Terrible came through for me, though. Like, with that with that uh, sacrifice, I feel, yeah, I feel like it worked out for me in a karmic level. Uh, not that I believe in that. This is for the purposes of uh, you understanding my personality. This is a fucking joke. <laughs> I don't actually think <laughs> that's true. Uh, sometimes people really, I don't know, sometimes sometimes it's not obvious through my speech on this show that uh, what I'm saying is a joke. So making that real clear. Okay. Towards the end of the book, I was starting to get real. I, I was running out of motivation. I was like, okay, I'm already not happy that we're in, you know, hero's journey. You got to get the girl, save the world land. And this book has been going on for, you know, 275 pages at this point. I'm just like, all right, all right, all right. Um, finally, we get to maybe the final, I think it was like the final 70 or 80 pages. I, I could be wrong. All of a sudden, there's an evil madman complete with minions. And I was just like, dude, this is so... There's like an action movie sequence where Tom is like, oh, man, I'm so cool now. I got, like, Victor's, like, fighting abilities. Oh, and he's like, oh, I'm so but strong and cool. Lionel like, hires, oh. like, a, a Japanese assassin cult to, like, yes. t- kidnap the... Fa- like, you didn't have to go that far, bro. Like, just, like, why all of a sudden is it very, like... Uh, Steven Seagal stars in the Time Master. Yeah, like okay. I'm gonna travel back in time and finally get the girl. She never paid attention to me in this reality. It really became because I couldn't play those sick blues licks just the way she likes. <laughs> it really became like Steven Seagal anime. For Steven <laughs> Steven Seagal Steven Seagal Steven Seagal <laughs> just a buff seagull that. Oh. 
I mean, I've had to deal Wears with some... Wears lame bandanas and plays the, the most blues dad licks that you've ever heard. Look, man, I've had to deal with some buff seagulls. They're no joke. I'm serious. <laughs> when I used to work on the uh, on the harbor in Boston, the seagulls were so aggressive that they would actually swoop down and steal your food from your hands. Many a child oh, yeah. cried. Many, many <laughs> people were very upset that a seagull managed to carry away half a grilled cheese. Like, they were <laughs> relentless. And then and then once one was successful, it's like if one grabbed a fry, then you would have a whole horde of seagulls descending upon you. And we try to tell people, like, don't fucking try to eat outside. They're like, I say so! The water! I'm like, nope, you're gonna get fucking seagull raided. Don't gonna do gulled. it. get gulled. It's just gonna <laughs> yeah, ask gonna get to gulled. be gulled. And then, and then sure enough... <laughs> Three minutes later, yep. child crying in yep. tears. My ice cream. It's like, well. You got gold, kid. Welcome to reality. <laughs> Welcome to being an adult. Anyway, Perhaps yeah. Perhaps you should build a time machine <laughs> and go back and. And kill the seagulls. No, please don't. <laughs> uh, we love that would have been life. a great motivator. Just like, I'm going to go back in time and end a species. I'm going to go back in time and end mosquitoes. Is should have been the Ooh, great motivator. What's the. But what's the ecological consequences of ending mosquitoes? I read some shitty article somewhere that told <laughs> me that, you know, if if you erase mosquitoes, it actually wouldn't be that big a deal. So I'm just going to go ahead and trust that completely. Okay. I mean, mosquitoes are definitely bad because not only are they annoying, but they carry some serious diseases that we don't have cures for. <laughs> so, like, I'm I'm willing to lean towards mosquito genocide um, you know what? If okay, you're Paris, you have a chance to go back in time and kill Mosquito Hitler. <laughs> do you do? <laughs> oh, Mosquito Hitler. Yeah, I think I. Mm. Not only does he suck blood and he's diseased, he's also racist. <laughs> I mean, all right, okay, all right, listeners. If you are a, uh, if you are a. I almost said a bug doctor. That is not what I meant. <laughs> if you uh, if you know anything about the ecological consequences of ending mosquitoes, of mosquito genocide, write in terriblebookclub at gmail.com. I'm actually serious. I am curious about this. I would like to know. Please tell me. Okay. Anyway, to, to get back to the point we started probably 12 minutes ago at this point. Um, so towards the end of the book, yeah, you get sudden cartoon villain. Like... When John Tom meets up with Lionel Gottrider in Reality B, um, you know, Lionel is like, oh, I, I tied up your family. Like, I hired, you know, and there's like a, a monitor showing Penelope and his family being like clubbed over the head and like fighting with a gun and getting yeah, right, shot. Yeah, right, like the evil villain series of computer yes, monitors. That actually happens in this book. And it really took me by surprise. I was like, this book felt, you know, for all the things I didn't agree with about it, it it felt pretty emotionally intelligent, like interesting. And then this stuff happened and I was like, this is really fucking stupid. I hate this now. And I was just, I was so demotivated at that point. And then, you know, you later find out that this was actually John Tom's idea when he encountered Lionel... Oh God, no! My my brain is not. He gets remembering. sent back in time fifty one years, and right. he's like, he thinks that this great big idea is like, okay, if I tell him when I meet him fifty one years in the past, just pretend that you're kidnapping them. It won't actually right. happen, but if you like convince me, that'll c- preserve the time loop. But right. also, Penelope and my family won't have been hurt. While we're on this topic, just for a second, Paris, mm-hmm. can I ask you? You can fifty one years backwards in real time. Yes. You don't have to eat or poop or pee or sleep. Yeah, and you don't age, even though they specifically said in an earlier passage that you that Lionel did age more because he was going back and forth in time. The same time yep. machine. Yeah, kind of fu- kind of fucking forgot about that really important detail. So when John Tom goes back fifty one years, he should actually be in his eighties because he, I believe, I might he might have been. In, I think he's in his late mid to late thirties. So, why is he not in his 80s? Why doesn't he have to I don't know. pee or poop or sleep or eat or anything? Does the t- it doesn't say sleep? that the time machine locks your biology in that one framed moment. 
No. So... I mean, I guess we're just supposed to assume that, but that's really shitty considering all of the consideration given to the other type of time machine in the beginning of the book. Suddenly, we get to, you know, this version and everything's just, I don't know, maybe just too tired. He was like, eh, I've gotten this far. <laughs> I Yeah. You know. But yeah, so that, that, that secondary time machine doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, and again, I just, I really didn't like the whole evil madman with minions at the end. Even the ex- I, like, I understand that he's like, oh, well, you should kidnap my family to motivate me, but I, it came just off way as is, very it's silly. Done is, it's corny as fuck, man. Yes, it's very corny. Um, and then at least you, an acre's worth of corn cobs. Over yes, here. yes, and they just pop, pop in the corns everywhere. Just a <laughs> sea of popcorn. And then you find out there's actually a stupid, uh, a stupid. <laughs> I am routinely finding out that there's a stupid nearly every day of my life, Paris. So. Meant to say second, and I said stupid. There is a second evil madman at the end who is Victor, the third uh, reality C version of Tom John. And that pissed me off because I was like, come on, dude, do we really need two comically evil like scenarios at the end where Victor is just ruthless and you find out eventually that Victor was actually the one who possessed John's consciousness and raped people. Uh, sorry, I should, I'm trying to get better about Roman Warren for that when we say it. But anyway, it's fine. You're here. You know what this is about. And I just felt, oh, God, I just really, I was not down for that third victoring at the end where it's just like, oh, he's so strong and big and evil. And then and then they're like fighting for dominance in his mind. And that's when there's like action movies shit happen. It's just, I so didn't. I mm. My view on this is if you're going to bring in alternate timeline personalities all crashing into this one moment to vie for control of their particular reality being the one that prevails why not just go all in and have 20 30 40 hundreds of different variations of tom's personality all fighting for control at that one moment in which they are all possibly created by slight variations of exactly when they threw the switch back up to you know preserve a certain reality and pre- prevent the Godfrider engine from going into meltdown. Like, maybe only California gets fucked up, and that's, like, a slightly different version from there. Maybe it's, like, half meltdown, and, like, you know, this version of Tom got his arm burned off because he got mm. pushed in front of the plume. Like, all these tiny little variables should be crashing into that one moment and having the ultimate mind fight where it's truly mental chaos, where you can't even discern what version of you is motivating you to do what well i i think there's only three consciousnesses because there were only ever three possible reality i don't i mean but you're right there's no real reason for three i mean the reason is that you have the engine is turned on and just runs normally you have engine is shut off right before critical mass and then i think you have engine never turned on yeah and that's the apocalyptic one because that's the one that just releases its energy as like a mega nuclear explosion but you have again all these little yeah. variables of like even the subsets of those three how are those oh, reached, right right or when do you exactly throw the switch back up and how much of a meltdown happens yeah i i get that he was trying to, i mean i i understand why he was trying to keep it simple but i just don't think to me, the third personality and the third reality was needless. What did it add to the story? Why what did, happens why? when you know the when it actually goes into full meltdown? Is, is, you need to, I guess, address that causality. No, you don't, happens? because you can say the only two possibilities were that it it ran normally or that it was shut off halfway through. You never have to say no one ever turned it on. Like it doesn't have to be a possibility. I, yeah, so I do agree with that, but if you're introducing that possibility, you must also introduce every other possible possibility, which is where my point comes in. Right? Yeah, so right, right. We agree on that. This is dumb. It's just that the, the degree of which it should have been used is different for us. Yeah. I, I Personally, I felt like the addition of the Victor Reality C didn't... 
It didn't work for me. And I know in the book it's painted as like, oh no, there had to be this third possibility because that's how we we close the loop and everything. But I don't I don't think that's true. I don't How think else so. are you gonna have Jomtor finally in that last moment able to fight off people action movie style yeah. if you don't have the Victor personality? Right? You really yeah, need it for that. I just didn't, didn't love it. Um All right. Well, do we have uh do we have anything else to say or should we move on to can we fix it? I say yeah, can we can we fix this? I don't know, for Chris. me, Paris, like if you change Lionel's motivation to be a little bit more science minded or egotistical greatest mind ever stuff, that would have sat better with me than both pe- like even if it was just Tom doing all this time travel stuff for love, but Lionel was like, What are you, an idiot? You're doing this for some puss? What's yeah, wrong with yeah, you? Yeah, right. I would have preferred that. Um, Tom should have learned his lesson that his ways of dealing with problems are ineffective and that he has value as an insightful emotional reader instead of just, I got GF and kid, hooray. Or even so- any of the other scenarios I mentioned during the episode of what could have been a better character development path for him other than that. And, and you know, I just, like, yeah, that's, it's the motivations that, that ruin this for me. But the sentence to sentence writing this book is really lovely and interesting and insightful. But the frame on which it is hung is decrepit and worn thin and splintering from overuse. <laughs> and you need to replace it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, for me, there's a lot to like about this book. It's, it's fairly well researched, you know, for something dealing with a technology that doesn't exist. It's well written. It does a good job handling time travel in the earlier parts of the book. It actually made me laugh a few times. Does an excellent job of describing emotions and parent-child relationships. Great dialogue. And overall, like, pretty fucking impressive for a first book. Gotta say that. I mean, I know this person writes for a living. But screenwriting and writing a book are different. So, yeah. Still think this this is a really good first attempt. All that being said, I don't think it needs to be as long as it is. It really feels like the ending was just kind of extended and a meandering mess. There is definitely a neater and shorter way to tie this up, especially without not one, but two absurdly comical villains at the end. Skip the sexual violence, however brief or alluded to. I didn't buy the love story at all. I mean, it begins as an obsession and ultimately is just a, we love each other because because we have to, because we're trapped in this novel. I... They don't have yeah, anything in common, works, right? by the way. I don't think we ever talked about that. Uh, Penelope and John Tom, like, don't... They don't connect on anything. They don't... There's no... There's, they really don't. There's no explanation except they just love each other. Um, so it, I didn't... And so the, the reason this is a big problem for me, it, it feels cheap in a book that seems like it should really deliver more on that front due to how adept it is in describing feelings and and relationships and emotions elsewhere. Um, I, you know, I think in terms of recommending this to someone, I might recommend this to someone, but only if they're really interested in time travel with the warning that the final, like, 75 to 100 pages could have been rewritten and trimmed. And it's still the hero's journey, you know, like I said, get the girl, save the world. Like, I I would only, I, again, this is like a very niche recommendation. Just like last episode, I was like, if you have very specific pornographic needs, sure, you know, for the last book we read. But same thing with this. It's like, like, if you're just like, hey, I really want to read books about time travel, I'd be like, well, you can give this a go. But yeah, I, I don't know if I would recommend it yeah it's not horrible it's not bad i might recommend it to someone as a good example of emotional writing if they want to study that or see how at least i think it could be done well but the 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 actual plot and story are just ultimately boring yeah, I guess if you're, I mean, although we, I mean, we do acknowledge that we're kind of outliers in this. So a lot of people do a like people reading. A lot of people love that shit. A lot of they, people love yeah. their romance. Like they love this very regular ass, like man lady love each other for no reason other than they love each other, smiley face, um, and have baby. So like, I don't know, man. I guess if that's your jam. Uh, sure. Then that, then, you know what? It's also it's kind of 
it's kind of long also to gamble on a on a on a lukewarm recommendation, right? It's like ah, you gotta read like four hundred pages. You might not like yeah. them, you know. Like uh, people who recommend you a video game that's like hundred thirty hours long, and they're like, okay, but like hour forty is where it really picks up. The, yeah. So I don't know. I yeah, I feel really torn about this because there are things I listed so many things about this that are good, but for me that didn't outweigh the things that were bad. It it almost almost did, but not quite. I think I think those I'm gonna agree. you know, my my opinions on on that, you know, on the hero's journey and the just kind of like regular ass, you know, white American love story stuff is just kind of I I am those are very deeply entrenched in me and that I really dislike those because I have been steeped in them my whole life and I find them boring and I think Chris feels the same way so it's pretty hard to get us to budge on that and that's I guess that's an us problem but yeah, yeah if, I if you don't care about that yeah, absolutely sure, go for great. this book I would say yeah I agree if you're not if you don't care about that and you're like oh maybe I want to read a time travel book that's like emotionally interesting I don't know I. <sighs> It's hard because I feel like I wouldn't recommend this because like I have friends that are into sci-fi and I I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend this to them. But I feel like if I had friends who were like, oh, I like I like romance books, I might be like, well, maybe give this a try if you're if you want to read a romance book that's like a little different from, you know. Cowboy Mac bought the ranch his grandfather <laughs> gave up twenty years ago. Next door. I'm Cowboy Mac and I'm horny. <laughs> Next door. <laughs> Matilda doesn't know what to do when this sexy cow man moves I'm in. I'm Matilda and I'm also horny. I live in the trash can across the way. <laughs> um, you know, I guess if you're if you're looking Yeah, you know what? I had to really talk this out to get there, but I think this book is not for people who are into sci-fi or time travel. This is a book for people who are into romance books. And they want a they want a wackier flavor than they normally I mean, there's get. There's plenty of time travel romances out there already. That's not even that fresh. Oh, are you talk are you talking about the stone touchers? <laughs> <laughs> I mean there's that, there's time traveler's wife, there's Ugh. all so- there's all sorts, Paris. Don't don't worry about it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I guess uh I would say I see a lot of value in this book, but ultimately I did not like it overall. And that is my Got final it. judgment. All right. Well, TBC Court has adjourned once more. Um thank you, patrons. Thank you to Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Arant, Senia, Jakub, like Chorus, Elliot. Kieran, Martin, Jay, Luchek, Miri, Yanka, David, Anya, Patricia, Austin, Donnie, Crimson, Paladin, Beast with the Least, Scott H., Robin, Laxtodes of the Void, the Taco-Eating Unicorn, Last Man on Earth 01, and our Kofi donor Kiwi thing. Thank you so much for supporting the show, everybody. We love you. Uh, it is very dark in my home, and I have to pee and get more liquids. Yes, yes same here. Well... See you next time, everybody. Oh, I didn't realize we had the episode. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Paris has to pee in her dark castle. I have no. I gotta go pee in the other timeline. I don't pee in this timeline. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> what are you? What are you gross? You're peeing in your own timeline. Oh. Ew. That's oh. that's the real utopia. It's like all human waste is deposited in the shit and piss dimension. <laughs> Clearly, the dimension upon which our reality is built. <laughs> All right, well, time to go hang out in that room then. Later, All right. Paris. All right, back to my trash can. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Terrible Book Club. Terrible Book Club is an independent podcast produced by your hosts, Paris and Chris. Sound design and audio editing by Chris, with sound effects and music by Epidemic Sound and sometimes also Chris. Our theme song is Kiss by Yearn, which is, you guessed it, actually, also Chris. You can find more of his soothing synthy sounds on Bandcamp at yearn.bandcamp.com. Do you want us to review a book of your choice on the show? Do you want access to some extra audiovisual weirdness? If so, become a patron at patreon.com slash terriblebookclub. 
If you'd like to send us a one-time tip instead, you can do that at ko-fi.com slash terriblebookclub. You can also support TBC for free by sharing the show on social media, following our accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Goodreads, telling your friends about your favorite episode, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else on the internet. To send us book recommendations or your adorable pet photos, send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com.